Financial books are going to say four out of five businesses fail. But the reality is if you incorporate, 40% less fail because it means you're doing the right thing. Most businesses fail because of $550 a month because it's on the startup phase. The reality is 92% of people worth $5 million or more have one thing in common, they own a business. All right, we're just gonna dive right in and I'm gonna start with the thing that is probably your biggest unwanted affiliate partner, the IRS. Like, tons of people are tipping the government unnecessarily and inadvertently, and I wanna give you strategies you can put on the ground within 24 hours that are substantial strategies. I feel like most of the financial world unfortunately talks about how people can scrimp and save and sacrifice and budget, and then they come to you as a business owner where you're really good at making money, and they try to separate you from that money in a retirement plan that isn't gonna save anyone taxes. If you put your money in a retirement plan, you are likely to pay more taxes in the future. The first reason, the government's $21 trillion in debt. Can you imagine someone coming up to you and saying, hey, why don't we partner? And then you find out that partner's $21 trillion in debt. You think they're gonna lower taxes in the future? Or you have a financial person that tells you, oh, it's okay, you'll be in a lower tax bracket in the future. Who's here because they wanna make less money? That's asinine. So instead, I'm gonna give you a framework and hopefully make taxes a little bit more fun than normal because it's not about deferring, it's not about spending a dollar to save 37 cents because this is a mistake I see tons of business owners and marketers make. They have a good year and then they go, okay, what am I gonna buy? And then you buy things you wouldn't have otherwise and by spending that dollar, you let the tax tail wag the dog. You spend a dollar, you save 37 cents and you lose 63 cents. If you're gonna do something like that, everyone here should know about tax arbitrage. Tax arbitrage is when you spend a dollar and you save more than a dollar. Like there's people in the room that we've done case studies with. Like one example is, anyone in here ever bought artwork before? I mean, you can actually buy art collections and then after owning it for three years, donate it and get back $2 for every dollars you spend. That's tax arbitrage. Right? Or if you own a building, you can learn about a historic easement or a conservation easement, which are ways that you can get two or three dollars for every dollar you spend on the real estate that you have. So I'll, I'll go through really specific strategies there, but let me break it down into a framework. The first part of the framework to save tax begins with the right team. Now, this is simple, yet probably the most hard part of it. You've got to have a bookkeeper, a controller, or a CFO, depending on your size of business, and then the two other pieces that are gonna save you the most tax other than the data collection is a tax strategist. Now some CPAs are tax strategists, most are not. Most CPAs are historians that tell you how much you've earned and what percentage of tax you have to pay because of that, right? A tax strategist actually meets with you proactively and talks about things that will add money to your life. The third piece, and this is where the biggest tax advantages come from, are a corporate or tax attorney that specializes in tax. What they're gonna help you do is reclassify your income so you pay a lot less tax, and then anyone here own a building, like actually still own a brick and mortar and operate out of, if that's the case, you wanna look into an engineer. An engineer can allow you to do cost segregation and accelerate the rate at which you take tax deductions on buildings. So you build this team, and as an entrepreneur, you meet with the team once a quarter, right? We're talking about maybe 20 minutes, no more than an hour, and rather than try to save money and try to invest money outside of your business, waiting for 10 or 20 years, this 20 minute to one hour call should save the equivalent in cash flow for you that year. So when you get on the phone with them, your job is to be the brainstorming entrepreneur and ask questions. Like here's some good questions to ask. What's the best tax strategy you did for someone else in the last 90 days? How can that apply to me? Then you just start asking about things in your life that you wish you could write off and find out how to write them off. Like I went to Italy last year and I called my, you know, we had a quarterly call with the team. I said, how can I write off my Italy trip? They're like, well, you can't really write it off. I said, well, let's talk about that for a minute. First off, I have three companies and I need to do my corporate compliance meeting once a year. What I found is I think better in Italy than I do in the United States. <laughs> and especially with a few glasses of wine. So now I got to write off the corporate compliance meeting because you can travel for that and write it off. The second thing is I said, what if I went and filmed where my great grandfather's from in San Giovanni and I used it in my origin story for a product we're creating? They're like, okay, well then that would merit more write-off. I said, what if I actually hosted a mastermind since I'll be there for two months for one of those days? By the end of that phone call, I had 55% of the trip that I got to legally and ethically write off, right? So 
You build this team, you meet with them proactively, and here's the big one. Every three years, you want to meet retroactively with a different accounting or tax professional. Anyone in here customize or modify software? Have you ever taken R&D credits? Because if you haven't taken R&D credits, if you have anyone domestically doing that, you can get credits above what you paid in the like for the employees. You can actually have credits for the time that was spent on it, for your time, for other people that were independent contractors' time. And you can go back three years and get that money back. Or if you've created any information product, or you had to do any research for anything that you did, there's something called domestic production credits. And you can get up to 9% of the net revenue back in tax advantages going back three years. So those are things called 199. You want to look into that because that's a lot of money for a lot of you that's simply being in the know versus just paying those taxes and forgetting about it. All right? So first part is you're building a team. You meet with them quarterly. And then you look back every three years. The next two pieces will make the bigger difference. The second one is deductions. And the best way to get deductions is ask one question. How does this relate to my business? And then secondarily, documenting that. Now, my documentation is pretty rudimentary. I print out the credit card statements. I have the businesses reimburse me for whatever I charge. And I write down what it was for. I've been audited twice in my life. I didn't owe extra money either time because that was suffice for the IRS. So it's just a matter of having some level of documentation. Here's a lot of deductions that most businesses don't take. And this is going to pay for a lot over the next year for you. There's something called the Augusta rule. Okay? The Augusta rule is you can take your home and you could bring in vendors, employees, customers, and you can actually rent your home out to your business 14 times a year. Now, your business writes a check and that's tax deductible. But when that money comes to you personally, that's tax free as long as it's 14 days or less. So in Austin, if anyone lives here, you can get major write-offs because there's always like Austin city limits and South by Southwest and there's F1 going on. And during those times, you could probably charge three times as much because how much would it cost to go get an Airbnb during that time or a conference room? So this is simply changing how your income comes in. Anyone have kids under 18 years old that they claim? Um, you know, so what you could do is pay them up to $12,000 a year. And the easiest thing to pay kids for is a modeling fee, which is $2,500 as a union standard. So do they show up on a website? Do they show up in an email somewhere? That's $2,500 tax deductible to the business and tax free to them. Just ask, did someone just? Every single year you can take 12,000. If you're having them model on a regular basis, you better be careful because $2,500 is for sure safe. If you go, well, they modeled six different times. Well, it better be very campaign specific, not something static on a website that's being replaced. Per kid. <laughs> Bam. We just saved you so much freaking money if you got that many kids. Now, they cost you a whole hell of a lot more than what you're saving. <laughs> You know, I figure the least that they could give me is a tax deduction because they're romance and sleep terrorists when they're really young, and I deserve to have some of that back in cash, right? <laughs> so whether it's like things I've done is I have three different companies, so I have three different offices for each company. One location where we have coaches that are in, one location that happens to be in the basement of my home, another location that happens to be above the garage where I have a cabin, but now I can write off multiple things like Augusta rule more than one property, or when I buy an espresso machine, that's really for the office. I happen to use it personally as well. Like, there's a lot of things you can do that most people miss out on. And look, if you're afraid because you feel like you're going to get audited, or you have an accountant that tells you a few things like, oh, my number one job is to keep you from getting audited, realize if, they, if an accountant tells you they're conservative, there's a different word for that called antiquated. They're letting you know that you're overpaying taxes, and when, they, when you find out, they're hoping that you don't fire them. Everything I'm going to give you, I've been doing for 20 years, and we've never had an audit go sideways. One, because we don't do anything offshore, and that does invite a little bit more risk. Two, we're looking at everything you can take advantage of legally and ethically and documenting it, so it's, it's actually very straightforward. But the reason why people get in trouble with the IRS is because they don't report income. If you don't report income that comes in, that's when you do jail time. If you take a, t a tax deduction that was maybe in the gray area and you're not sure whether you could take it or not, if it was less than 20% of your overall tax deductions, you're facing a 9% penalty, right? No jail time, a 9% penalty. That's not a bad interest rate. 
You're just paying 9% for use of that money rather than giving it to the government. Okay, so if it's a minor thing, just make sure it's documented. But here's where people get into trouble too, is if it's more than 20% of your overall tax deduction, so you take a major tax deduction on something they disallow, there's a 25% penalty. So you just have to look at this and understand. How much of a tax deduction is it in relationship to your overall tax deductions? Document it and continue to ask the question, how does this relate to my business? Now there's other times where I've been told, you know, oh, well, I can't write things off. We have a, a client that's a rapper, not our normal clientele. But uh, this rapper said that he couldn't write off all the things he was buying for his videos, including his clothes. And when you read the, the code, it says, if you could wear those clothes out there in everyday public, then you can't write it off. And I'm like, I don't know that this rapper wears that out every day, but who knows? I don't know a lot of rappers. I'm not hanging out with them normally. It's not, you know, big money for us to work with them. A lot of pain in the ass normally. So ultimately, we just set up a production company. So Jeff, you do documentaries, you have a production company, all of a sudden you're buying, you could buy props, you could buy uniforms, you can do tons of stuff within that simply because you have the right entity. So the type of entity you choose matters. So the first part to save tax is you build the right team, you meet on a quarterly basis on a proactive manner, you brainstorm and they tell you whether you can do that or not, and then every three years get a different set of eyes and go back and see if there's something. You can look at R&D credits, domestic production credits, anyone selling things internationally? So if you sell things internationally, you should look into an international sales corporation as well because you can cut your taxes in half on that. All right, the third category, so the second one was deductions. The third category is the game changer. It's called reclassification, and this is why 100% of entrepreneurs that don't understand this will overpay their taxes this year. In the past, we found 93% of people overpaying their tax, but with the new tax plan that came in from Trump, we're finding pretty much everyone's missing out on this. Reclassification has four key areas. The first area is how do you take your active income and make it passive? Passive income could be you choose an S corporation. You pay yourself a reasonable salary, which is what would you pay someone else to do your job, not what you're worth, and you take the rest in distributions. Those distributions avoid self-employment tax, which saves you at least 3.2%, and for many of you, 15.3%, just how you write the check to yourself, right? So that's turning active income to passive. Or if you owned your building, you could charge yourself a high rate. Or if you could do anything that creates investment income versus active income, it's going to lower your taxes. The second thing, is taking ordinary income and turning it into capital gains. So Trump misquoted this when he was in the debates with Hillary. He said, uh, Warren Buffett pays less tax than his secretary. That's actually not true. Warren Buffett pays a lower tax rate than his secretary, but pays more taxes. The reason he has a lower tax rate is almost all of his income comes from capital gains, which is half of the rate of what his ordinary income would be. So two ways you can do that, just as examples. That international sales corp, anytime you're selling something internationally, you run it through an international sales corp, and that will be taxed at capital gains instead of ordinary income. Or anyone heard of a captive insurance agency before? So you can actually put money in pre-tax into something like that, hold on to it for at least 12 months, but if you don't have an insurance claim, it's you and your money that's your insurance policy, not an actual insurance policy, you're the company. If you don't have that claim, you get to take it out as a capital gain therefore cutting your tax in half, right? So that's ordinary income to capital gains. The first one was taking active to passive. The third one I like even better. The third one is how do you take taxable income and make it tax-free? Anyone against that? All right, so here's how you do it then. Charitable trust would be one of the ways you could do it. So let's find any charity that you feel any uh, of, you know, affinity for, that you like, you can actually donate highly appreciated assets like businesses, real estate, or stock, and when you donate it to the charity, you get a partial tax deduction the moment you donate it. You don't have to sell the business or sell the real estate, you get a partial tax deduction for the donation. When you sell the business, there's zero tax upon the sale, none, and it funds this trust. You're the first one that benefits from the trust, not the charity. And you can take between 5% or 50% income off of that full sell per year, depending on how you invest the money and how well the investment does. So rather than paying tax, you're getting a tax deduction. Zero tax when you sell it, you get a benefit from it your entire life, and when you die, the charity is supposed to keep at least 10%. So would you rather give the charity of your choice 10% or the government 37%?
right? So that's one tax-free strategy. Another one could be if you want to sell your business but not to some outside entity, you can actually use something called an ESOP, Employee Stock Option Program. You could sell your business internally to your employees. Banks will actually finance it for you, and you'll pay no tax when they buy that stock. That's another example. Or an installment sale when you go to sell your business. Look, anyone in here that ever plans on selling their business, you need to know what your tax strategy is today, not when you sell. Two out of three business owners, when I go speak, that are saying that they're selling their business cannot take advantage of all of the tax advantages out there because they already have a letter of intent, they already have a broker, they've already moved forward with it and thought, oh, I'll deal with the tax after I sell. The bottom line is that is going to cost you at least 50% on the tax by not having the strategy ahead of time. And for some people, it's gonna cost them a whole amount of tax that they could have completely eliminated, all right? So, got to know the tax strategy. So on this reclassification, it's how do you turn active into passive, then it's how do you turn ordinary income into capital gain, taxable income into tax-free income, which by the way, as an entrepreneur, it's a phenomenal thing for you because the first 300 pages of the tax code tell everyone why they have to pay tax. The next several thousand pages say why you don't have to pay tax as a business owner. That's how it works. If you don't know how to play the game or pass the test, you're gonna pay more than you need to. And if you go back and look in the past, you might get a lot of money back. But here's one thing I know for sure, is if you just take a little time now, you're gonna save a lot more in the future. And we're only talking about one of the areas where people are losing and leaking money, which is tax. Now the fourth strategy of reclassification. The fourth strategy is the tax arbitrage strategy. So that's any time you can spend a dollar and get more than a dollar back. That's anything from solar credits to film credits to, like we had someone in West Texas that recently came to one of our workshops and they had a bunch of land in West Texas that they told me was worth nothing because they said it was just empty. The reality is it had a bunch of sand and sand is required for fracking and so what we did was we went in and had it evaluated that if they were to develop it and use the sand, what would that be worth? And they got a six and a half to one deduction. So for the price of the land, they got a 6.5 times tax deduction, essentially putting a bunch of money in their pocket and a lot more than what they paid for it. There's other people that actually own buildings in historical neighborhoods, and you can actually donate the facade of the building, and of all places, it's the forest service that determines the value. I mean, I can't even make this shit up if I tried. <laughs> I was like, what's a weird way to do that? Oh, the forest service, great, let's, let's, yeah, that makes sense. So you actually go and they say, here's what that's worth, and you can donate the facade of the building, still renting it out, still renting to yourself, to other people, but you get a tax deduction if you agree to never tear it down and you preserve the look of that building. That's tax arbitrage. The whole art strategy of, you know, I bought $2.2 million of art for $300,000, and then after owning it for three years, I can donate it to any of the museums that I want and I get back basically $600,000 in tax credits or $2.2 million of tax deduction. So a lot of this is just knowing that it's out there. The wealthiest people all know about this because when I was 22 years old, I went into a family office in New York City and I had this eye-opening experience. The first thing that happened was I was shadowing this financial guy who didn't want me there, but I convinced his wife to let me follow him around because I want to figure out like, what are the wealthier people doing than what I was doing? At the time, I was selling mutual funds, and yeah, that was going fine in 98 and 99, but in the year 2000, the market started to go down, and the firm I worked with, they told me to tell people they're in it for the long haul. That just sounds stupid, right? Like, when does the long haul end, by the way? When you die, so that's just like the best excuse. That would be like, oh, this marketing campaign's not working out, we're just gonna keep putting money into it, hopefully that'll turn around. And that's what they want us to do with our money, or they said even worse things like, tell people the market's on sale. How awesome is it when you bought something and then it goes on sale the next day that you can't cash it in for what you paid for, it's just basically a realized loss. I didn't wanna tell people that. So I went and watched this guy, and the first person he met with was $20 million net worth on Wall Street with less than $500,000 in the stock market. That was an eye-opener. The second person he was presenting a $400 million strategy to, that person wasn't in the room, they had a family office. And that family office meant there were attorneys, accountants, investment advisors, all types of specialists analyzing whether the deal was right or not. Hell, that was the first time I saw due diligence. In the world of finance, you hear that term all the time. It's a lot like Sasquatch. You hear about it every day, but no one's actually ever seen it. You know what I'm saying? 
And I, had, I was like, it opened my eyes, and I was like, wow, this is crazy. The first job of a family office is to save tax. Why? Because it's a guaranteed return. It's not speculative. It's not waiting for 10 or 20 years. It's not locking your money up till 59 and a half. It's not hoping you'll be in a lower tax bracket in the future. It's a guaranteed return that, by the way, you could turn around and invest right back into your marketing, right back into your business, and gives you this amazing insider advantage where the rest of the world, they're so stuck in trying to save 10% of their money and then try to earn 10% on it. And the problem with that is 98% of the time when people are 65, they're not economically independent. You want to kick ass in business, here's the key. Get your assets to produce enough cash flow to cover your lifestyle expenses. Not like an elaborate life, but just a life that you go, I know everything's handled. Now, every single active dollar you earn can go into growing your business, and that'll give you a 10 times advantage over everyone else that's addicted to their active income covering their life. Economic independence is a separator where people go, how do you grow your business as fast? Because my business doesn't rely upon me paying all my personal bills. And I see far too many businesses being bastardized because the person treats it as a lifestyle and not as a business. And they're just confiscating all that wealth. So instead of budgeting, instead of scrimping, the key is this. Set up a separate account immediately, like today or tomorrow, rather than you're checking your business account. Just a personal account, it could be checking savings or money market and label it your wealth capture account, okay? And on that account, every time you take money from your business and pay yourself personally, have it automatically split off and pay a certain percentage to this new account. My recommendation is 18%. Not a business income, but personal income. Now, you can do that over time because that 18% can come from saving on tax, saving on interest. If a business owner has more than one loan, four out of five times they're paying more interest than needed because they either haven't negotiated a better interest rate or they don't know about the four C's. The first C is if you have collateral, it lowers your interest rate. The second C is if your credit score is above 780, it lowers your interest rate. The third C is if you have the right cash flow reporting, you have better access to money. We had someone that's, I don't know, erroneously, they put a $200,000 uh, donation to their church as an education expense. Better than a lottery expense. I know people that were like donating to a church and doing lottery tickets. I have yet to see that work out. But they did this and it denied them getting a loan. All we did was reclassify it as what it was supposed to be, which was a charitable donation, and then they got the loan at a good interest rate. So having the right cash flow reporting, most businesses don't have good cash flow reporting, and the last piece is the right connections because certain lenders lend really well to businesses and others don't, but when you do that, you're gonna save a boatload of money. We call it cash flow optimization. It's $2,484 per month per half million of revenue that people boost when they just know how to manage their cash flow. The tax savings is $11,470 per $250,000 of revenue. That's cash right to the bottom line. That's not revenue that you then pay for employees and and overhead and cold traffic and all that kind of stuff. It's just your cash that's rightfully yours. And if you set up a separate account, this wealth capture account, and you automatically send money over to there, you're gonna build yourself staying power. First off, when you get to six months of personal expenses set aside in liquidity, you'll have more peace of mind. You'll have more peace of mind. And if you're married, then you'll especially have more peace of mind because I know how entrepreneurs are. We think optimistically and we're gonna put the pedal to the metal and everything's always gonna work out. And then we spend that optimism by reinvesting too quickly. And then our spouse goes, now when did you say this was gonna work? And does it put everything we've done in jeopardy? So if you create that liquidity, you're going to be able to produce at a different level. You're gonna think differently. When it gives above six, six months of expenses, it becomes your investment fund. And here's the deal. Rookie investors always stay invested. That's a rookie mistake. To invest early, often, and always is an erroneous myth where people think if they're in a long haul and they wait for 30 years, it's gonna work out. I've already said 98% of the time it doesn't. So instead of always being invested, automatically save, deliberately invest. Now is the time to store cash because you can either buy businesses or you could buy assets at a major discount. And my entire investment philosophy is not playing not to lose. That's what far too many investors do. Playing not to lose is called diversification. And diversification for most people is diversification. You spread yourself thin, you get in more things that you understand, you don't know whether it's gonna work out or not, you don't know who's investing in it, you don't even know what, what's going on in those boardrooms. Hell, isn't it hard enough to keep up with our own boardroom as our business grows? And so don't diversify, that's playing not to lose. If you're extraordinarily wealthy, diversification's great. The second thing, and this is the addiction the entrepreneur has, is playing to win. Playing to win is the entrepreneurial treadmill, where people are just running faster, working harder, investing more money, but they're not keeping more. 
because there's that surprise tax bill, because they haven't managed their interest rates and their collateral and all those kind of things I just talked about. And then when that surprise happens, it's a big setback. So playing to win, these are the two questions. A, at what cost? And is the juice worth the squeeze? Is it a game worth winning, right? Does it increase your quality of life? Does it allow you to live wealthy along the way? Benjamin Franklin said, wealth isn't just the man that has it, it's the man that lives it. So I like win, then play. Win, then play with investing is you make money on the buy. When you buy, you already know that you've made money because you either bought that business where someone was in a desperate situation for liquidity, or you bought that real estate when the market just tanked or someone needed to liquidate really quick. People with cash have buying power. Build up cash, invest in your own business first and foremost in the right people, processes, and automated technology and procedures because you can build equity and cash flow simultaneously where almost every other investment is one dimensional and it's only about accumulation. Economic independence and cash flow first, save a load of tax and put that money back into your life, restructure your loans, take any underperforming assets that aren't earning interest and pay off high interest rate loans, it's a guaranteed return, and then look for all the things that look like they're minor that have major impact. Like if you're investing money and you think you're earning 10% but you find out there's, that you're only earning 9.2% because of some hidden fees, uh, some non-performing fees, some commissions, 100 grand at 10% over 30 years, grows to 1.74 million bucks. Not bad. It's bullshit, it's never gonna happen, but at the same time, that's what people show. The second thing though is if you have that same 100 grand only earning 9.2%, 1.4 million. That's $340,000 of wealth confiscated from your life simply because we're not trained to pay attention, but you're a marketer that knows how to pay attention to other areas, let's at least take a peek at it, even if it's just annually, and put that money back into your life and pocket and then the last piece is there's a lot of duplicate coverages, improper structure, inefficiencies when it comes to insurance. So this is the philosophy. Only insure the catastrophic, never the inconsequential. Something's inconsequential if you can write a check for it today and you still sleep well at night. And 90% of what people pay for insurance is inconsequential. Low deductibles, short-term type of policies. They don't look at it, they just buy it because nobody woke up this morning going, you know what, I should look at my insurance, that would be a great day. But the reality is, this is money for your life, and if you automatically pay yourself first, whether you have a payroll service that sends you two checks, one for you to spend, one for you to save, or whether you automatically sweep it over where your bank says, every time we make a deposit, we're gonna put the money over here. When you start saving on tax, interest, insurance, and investments, and you automatically capture that, it's not about working harder, it's not about budgeting, it's not about sacrifice. I hate that term, sacrifice. The term sacrifice, maybe in a religious context, has some value, which means to make sacred. In every other area of life, sacrifice is a no-win exchange. It's, I'm going to give up something now in the hopes of something better in the future. We've been asked to do that in finance, and if we read 100 financial books, they're never going to tell you the truth. Financial books are going to say four out of five businesses fail, but the reality is if you incorporate, 40% less fail because it means you're doing the right thing. Most businesses fail because of $550 a month, because it's on the startup phase. The reality is 92% of people worth $5 million or more have one thing in common, they own a business. Your business is your catalyst for wealth. You understand it, invest in it properly, and capture that wealth personally so that you lock it in instead of just give it away. Want to master your money? Want to figure out the things that you could do to improve your finances? Click here and check out more videos like this on Money Matters.